Okay, welcome everyone. So, welcome to this edition of the Brazilian Algebraic Geometry Seminar. Today, we have the pleasure of uh, receiving Simone Marquesi, who is uh, currently at the University of Barcelona after many, many years in Brazil. So, it's good to have him back within the Brazilian Algebraic Geometry community. And he's going to talk about, uh, I forget now, Simone. Don't worry, I will tell you, I will tell you a little bit. But well, before, before sharing my screen, I was, of course, want to thank the organizer for inviting me. It's, well, it's obvious how much I'm affectionate to Brazil and how many friends I see here in the talk. And it's a pity that I cannot be with you personally, but I'm happy to see you, that you're well, and I hope that your family are, are well too during this particular times. So I'm going to, you should see my screen and my talk. Yeah? Can, I don't yes, see we, any... we, we can see it, yes. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, group actions on vector bundle and the philosophy also I want to pass is how do we choose uh, such groups and uh, and their action? And uh, well, we start as usual with fixing some notation, and as usual we will work. Well, as usual for me, we will work over the complex numbers. And uh, if we think about the vector bundle on the projective space, and the first action of a group uh, that we can think on it it's uh, a change of coordinates. So we can take an element of the projective linear group and apply a change of coordinates on our projective space. And this is the most natural and first uh, action that we can think of. And this is actually leads to our first definition. We say that a vector bundle of rank R on PN is homogeneous if it's basically invariant up to any change of coordinates of the projective space, okay? And the fact of being variant by this group actually leads to a very nice geometric description of uh, the locus of its jumping lines. Let's recall a little bit the definitions. Uh, we know by Grothendieck's theorem that if we have a, a rank R vector bundle on the projective space, then if we fix a line of the projective space, the restriction of the vector bundle on the line splits as a direct sum of line bundles and the degrees the integers that we find in the splittings are called the splitting type of the bundles on the line and we also know that for an open set uh, in the Grassmannian so for an open set of lines this split is the splitting type is constant it is called the generic splitting type and in the complementary closed set of the lines, uh, we have a different splitting and these lines are called jumping lines. In particular, if we think about a rank two vector bundle uh, on the projective space, well, the splitting is given by, the restriction is given by two summons and in the generic splitting type, the two integers have the lowest gap possible. So the jumping lines is when the gap between the two integers is, is bigger. Okay, uh, so we, how do we call bundles who have the splitting, uh, which is the same for each line? Well, these vector bundles are called uniform, as we see before with the, um, the air to put, the, 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 the sequence of the air integers that we have is constant for each line, then the bundle is called uniform. And there's a, a immediate connection between these two definitions because, of course, any homogeneous bundle is a uniform bundle because we can think, we can send any two lines one to the other through um, an element of one element, specific element of the projective linear group. And the, the invariant says that the splitting is fixed for each one of the lines. And it, if this connection is immediate and it's almost as natural to ask what about the reciprocal uh, implication what about uh, about what do you know about uh, uniform if uniform implies homogeneous and this question was first posed in, in uh, 1961 by schwarzenberger well as you can see in the next slide this was quite 
uh, there, there, there's a lot of work during the 70s and 80s about uh, this uh, about this problem, and I'm just telling you now the state of the heart of what we have. Uh, well, if uh, the rank uh, is smaller than the dimension of the base projective uh, uh, space and the vector bundle is uh, uniform, then we know that this splits as direct sum of line bundles. And this is the work of Van de Ven and Saito. So in this case, uniform implies homogeneous. And there's many works that lead to the, the final two that are mentioned here of Elia and Balico which states that uh, um, actually one of the titles is uh, uniform bundles of rank n plus one or something like that are what we expect. I mean, they are all homogeneous, uniform implies homogeneous up to rank n plus one on Pn, and they are uh, tangent bundle plus, uh, or direct sum of line bundles or tangent or cotangent bundles uh, plus uh, direct sum, okay? But, uh, in general, this implication does not hold because we have the first example of 1979 by Allen of a rank four bundle on P2, which is uniform, but not homogeneous. And uh, the, last, the, 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 the last examples that we have are by Dreze in 1980, where we construct a family of rank two n vector bundles of Pn, which are uniform, but not homogeneous. And so it's still open to know what happens in the gap between n plus one or, or 2n. This 2n is still the lowest rank that we have on Pn uh, in order to, uh, for a uniform bundles which are not homogeneous. Just to investigate a little more this problem, while well, we were working, I was working with Elsa Maria Miladoc of the University of Barcelona, and we stumbled upon this example that, that started it all. Uh, and I mean, I give you this example, and I want to uh, I want to see with you what are his characteristics, and then we'll try to generalize it. But everything started from this example. So we have this vector bundle, which is defined as the kernel of this of the kernel. Sorry, as the kernel of this map from eight copies of OP2 to three copies of the uh, OP21. And I give you the specific matrix of definition, matrix eight three by eight of linear forms, X, Y, Z are the coordinates of P2. And what can we say about this bundle? Well, first of all, this is called the Steiner bundle. Steiner bundle uh, were studied by Schwarzenberger, by Dolgachev and Caprano. That's the first very important work that led many, many, many others. And the uh, uh, Steiner bundle on the projective space is defined as the kernel of um, of a map between copies of OPN and copies of OPN1, okay? So they are defined basically by this matrix of linear forms, okay? Moreover, I want to show you what happens when we restrict the bundle, the example that I've showed to you uh, on one line. Well, let us consider first, oh, sorry, there is, um, there's, it's Z, of course, equal to alpha X plus beta Y. I'm consider first this family of lines and considering this restriction is basically due to the substitution. Yes, and so the bundle restricted to the line will be defined as the kernel of this matrix that you can see here. Um, but what happens with this matrix? If we apply linear combinations of the columns using this block X and Y, which is far on the right, uh, can you see? I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see also my mouse pointer? So I use yes. like yes, a point. Yes, can see it. Thank you. Um, so using this x block x y on the right, uh, we can vanish the last line. This part. So with the other two blocks, we can vanish also these two columns. This means that two vanishing columns mean that we have on the kernel two copies of OL. And <coughs> sorry. Each one of the three blocks x, y gives us a summon ol minus one. Uh, I've done it only for this family of, of lines, but uh, uh, dividing all lines in P2 by a finite number of, of families and doing analog analogous computation, the idea it's always the same. We prove that um, the splitting is constant for uh, every line and is of type minus one, three copies and zero, two copies. 
So this bundle is uniform. Moreover, uh, this is not just uniform, but the degrees are only minus one and zero. And so we decided to uh, put a bound on the degrees that we could manage, and we define a K-type uniform Steiner bundle, a uniform bundle, of course, which has a sum of degree minus K, at least one, that's that AK uh, positive, up to zero. So it's a Steiner bundle, so we cannot go further than zero. And AI, of course, means the number of summons that we have for uh, the summoned OL minus I. Okay, so my, the example I showed you is a minor, it's a one type uniform Steiner bundle, one type uniform bundle. And uh, generalizing, my, starting from that example, we actually managed to uh, construct families for each projective space and we managed to bound the rank. So the first result that I'm presenting is that when we have one type uniform uh, Steiner vector bundle with no trivial summons, and it will be clear in a second why I want that, uh, then the rank is bounded from below by C plus two times N minus one and from above by C times N. Moreover, these two bounds are sharp and we can construct, we can explicit uh, one type uniform standard bundle for each one of the ranks in the range that I, uh, that I, that I showed you. Okay. Okay. So before giving idea, I, I will give uh, ideas of the proofs uh, around the talk, but before giving an idea, I want to make a remark that, I mean, if you look, of course, at the work of Ellingweig and Dreze, uh, they do construct uh, um, uniform Steiner bundle, which are not homogeneous in a very geometrical and elegant way, but constructing this one type uniform, which spoiler alert, some of them will not be homogeneous or what are we talking about? Um, but constructing these examples, I give, I, I, I can give you explicit metrics. And just to give an idea, this, I mean, this is one matrix, eh? it's too big that I cannot fit the, uh, or horizontally, but uh, we managed to construct all these families. But the, an idea of the proof, well, the upper bound, of course, is given by the hypothesis that I tell you before that I have no trivial summons because, of course, I could take any one type uniform bundle and add trivial summons as many as I want and deal with this will stay one type uniform. And the upper bound is simply given when no trivial summon by CN because, um, let me just go back a little bit to the first example. Uh, having no trivial summon basically means not to have zero columns in the defining matrix. So in this case, n equal to two and c equal three, the rank is um, six. So this will be a three by nine matrix. And if a three, if it's a three by nine matrix, in order not to have zero columns, that means that we have to extend. I mean, have blocks, uh, blocks in the matrix where in each block there's all the uh, coordinates, okay? So if we stretch the most that we can, these this linear forms in order not to get uh, zero columns, then we just have um, many summons of the cotangent, uh, twisted by one, sorry, I forgot to twist it by one, but this is the cotangent, the cotangent bundle, okay? And to prove the lower bound, actually, we see that uh, being Steiner one type uniform allows us to uh, give an association of our bundle to another one in the Grasmanian. And in the Grasmanian of lines, this one that you see below, it's also called a Steiner bundle. This is actually uh, Q denotes the N minus one rank uh, uh, universe, uh, universal bundle on the, on, in the Grasmanian. And this is, was actually uh, the topic of my PhD thesis and where we proved that the rank uh, is at least the dimension of the Grasmanian. And so this uh, bound on the rank of F gives us the lower bound that we want, okay? Just to uh, say something more, another nice thing that we managed to prove is that when we have a wine type 
<laughs> uniform vector bundle, uh, then if it's not of a minimal rank, it can be obtained as an extension by uh, copies of the trivial bundle and a minimal case of one type uniform vector bundle. And so uh, if we think, just to give a hint, I hope, I'm not too uh, confused about it, but to give a hint, as we see, we have these matrices of, light, of linear forms, and doing an extension by copies of the trivial bundle, it means adding columns. And so, basically, each matrix comes from a matrix of a minimal one-type uniform, adding columns in a particular way to maintain the one-type uniformity. And this is always possible. That's the meaning. That's the meaning of this of this result, okay? And so basically, all the one type uniform are collecting by paths, we could say, of deleting and adding columns in the defining matrix, okay? Okay, but now there's also another uh, way to, there's another thing to take into consideration that is, um, homogeneous part, the homogeneous part. So let's go back to our first example, E, it's the bundle, the first bundle, that the example that started it all. And in this case, this is a specific matrix. So, for example, you could take Macaulay and uh, compute its resolution and has a resolution of this type with a matrix alpha of forms of degree two. So let's apply um, a change of coordinates. So let's... Um, Let's apply the action of the projective linear group. And so we have this new bundle, which is defined by the matrix where we apply the change of coordinates in the defining matrix, in this matrix of the resolution. So this is the meaning of this T alpha. And if we suppose that this is invariant, well, this isomorphism that we have on the right, because of the resolution we have, extends to isomorphism to all the resolution, okay? And so basically the invariance, and this is a key point that I will use many, many times in, the, in this talk, this invariance being uh, uh, equivalent to having this commutative diagram, uh, it's fundamental because uh, in this case, what we have, let, let, let's, let's think, the matrix alpha is um, given by six forms of degree two in three variables, but there are only six forms of degree two in three variables. This must be linearly independent because I don't have any sum and O minus one inside E. So I basically taking, I'm basically taking a basis of degree two forms on P2. And so if we do a change of coordinates, well, we, we, we arrive also to another basis of degree two forms on P2. And this will be connected by a linear combination and such linear combination will be expressed into this central isomorphism. So unfortunately, well, unfortunately or fortunately, this case, this particular bundle is homogeneous. But what do we have for higher? Uh, for our other examples, and I start basically on P2. Well, because when I have a one-type uniform bundle on P2 with function class minus C and rank C plus two, then we can still find the resolution, the Steiner hypothesis and uniform of type one gives us technical lemmas that allows us to find uh, a resolution for the bundle. Well, we have two resolution war for uh, odd, term odd first term class and one for even first term class, but still we have the resolution. And uh, um, once we have the resolution, then uh, we can find for C greater or equal to four, all the families that we constructed before, we can prove that they are not homogeneous. And the idea, it's the same I told you before, the idea I'm going to use many times. If it's invariant, if we suppose it to be homogeneous, then we have this isomorphism here, but this isomorphism expands to <coughs> isomorphism of all the resolution here again. And look now at this particular map alpha. Let's let's see what it's it's composed of. It has a form of degree two and 
C plus two forms of um, of degree C minus three over two minus two, but that's not important. A higher degree and degree higher than two. So if we apply a change of coordinates to this matrix, to this to this matrix alpha, well, we are going to get another form of degree two, which will not be um, a scalar multiple of my previous one. So this could get a contradiction. So all the bundles I constructed before, well, that I told you that I constructed, but they are there, uh, are not homogeneous. So we have these infinite explicit families of bundles which are uniform, yet not homogeneous. Okay? Uh, just want to finish this first part by saying something. Of course, we uh, gave a look also to the K-type case, and we can we have uh, a result also on uh, a bound uh, boundary on the rank from above and from below. If you suppose not to have trivial summon, this unfortunately this bound we get is not sharp, uh, but we still manage to uh, explicitly construct infinite families uh, of K-type uniform standard, standard bundle and prove them that they're not homogeneous. At the end, we conjecture, at the end of the work I mentioned before with uh, Miro Roch, uh, we conjecture that if it's a K-type uniform bundle that it comes as a kernel, I mean, I, I, it must fit inside the short exact sequence that I showing you in the slide and they are all and only the ones that we construct using our uh, specific process, okay? And we believe that, I mean, this could be used um, for other purposes because, I mean, we want to explore the fact that we have these uh, explicit matrices, okay? Okay, so what about <coughs> other groups? Well, uh, how do we choose? other groups well now i'm going to tell you my my point of view or, or my way of seeing things um as you uh, saw in my slightly long abstract actually uh, in 2001 ancona and ottaviani uh, proved that uh, invariant uh, steiner bundles after a specific action of special inner group are schwarzenberger and the year before, Valles did the same with a rank two vector band that's not being Steiner on P2, and also about this action of special inner group uh, and proves that there are Schwarzenberger. And in my way, how, how, how do you see this? Uh, how do they arrive to consider a specific group and a specific action? Well, they both looked into the set of unstable hyperplanes. For example, Ancona Taviani, if you have a Steiner bundle as the one that I uh, defined you before, a Steiner bundle doesn't have global sections because global section would mean to have a trivial sum. So if we think about undecomposable Steiner bundles, then it doesn't have any uh, global section. And uh, the unstable hyperplanes are upper planes of PN such that the restriction of the Steiner bundle acquires global sections. And they are looking and they study the geometry of the unstable hyperplanes in the dual projective space. Okay? And if the bundle is Schwarzenberger, this geometry, lo geometry locus, this locus, sorry, is a rational normal curve. And so the invariance is associated to Schwarzenberger because the invariance passes to an invariance in the dual projective spaces and they maintain this rational normal curve. So the trick is always like, look at the geometry locus of the unstable hyperplanes. Um, sorry, by the way, before I continue, I'm only seeing my screen. I don't see any of you. So if there's any question, I mean, just let me know, but I'm only seeing my screen right now. That's, uh, well, that's another thing why we enjoy very much when we'll be able to see each other again. Uh, and uh, uh, another choice of the group, for example, was considered by Orly Kite in Terao, 
when we pass to hyperplane arrangement. Hyperplane arrangements are a finite union of hyperplanes in the projective space. I'm particularly fond of this argument lately. And uh, a reflection is given by um, uh, um, an element of uh, linear group that fixes the points of the hyperplane and is a finite order. And uh, they say that reflection arrangement, so the uh, arrangements which are invariant through the groups, uh, the group defined by all the reflection, which is spanned by all the reflections, are free. Free means that their associated uh, reflexive shift, which I will define, sorry, in a little bit, it's a direct sum of line bundles, so that is uh, homogeneous, okay? And uh, in another work with uh, Jean Vallès, we were studying these nearly free vector bundles, and we discovered that these nearly free vector bundles have a specific geometric locus of the jumping lines. Uh, so this raised another, uh, the, the consideration to, uh, of another group. But let me just introduce a little bit. We have an arrangement of lines. We have a finite number of lines in the projective plane that are defined by a uh, homogeneous equation, which I denote by F. And to an arrangement of lines, we can associate the reflexive shift, which is given by the kernel of the Jacobian matrix, basically. Okay, this is a matrix given by all the uh, three um, partial uh, derivatives, okay? And in particular, a concept which was introduced by Dean Castiglaro is the concept of nearly free vector, uh, nearly free arrangement of nearly free vector bundle. Here we are on P2, so reflexive shift is a vector bundle. A nearly free vector bundle is given by uh, this resolution. Okay, so what we um, discovered with Jean is that uh, when we have a nearly free vector bundle, then the geometric locus, the, the locus of jumping lines is very special because all the jumping lines pass through one point of the projective space. So it's a, we have a jumping line, if and only if, it's a line passing through a point P. And moreover, the order of the jump, so the difference that we have in the cap between the two exponents, between the two integers that I was telling before, it shifts only by one. So this is the order of jump is always equal to one. That's why we perceive the importance of this point and we call it a jumping point associated to vector bundle. So we always say that F is a nearly free vector bundle with jumping point equal to P, okay? Moreover, when we give a point P and a couple of, uh, and a couple of integers, which are the two integers A and B, which are called the exponents and are the ones that appear in the resolution, then um, up to isomorphism, we can think of the point P uh, and up to a change of coordinates, we can think that the point P is 0, 0, 1. And so there's basically only one near P vector bundle with those exponents. And it is given by the specific matrix X, Y and the power of uh, Z by B minus A plus 1. So these are the near three vector bundles, okay? And, okay, looking at this specific uh, configuration of the jumping line, we thought, well, do they characterize indeed nearly free vector bundle? And we arrived to the conclusion that is almost. Why? Well, if I denote by S of E the scheme of the jumping lines in the dual projective plane and by while the order of jump that I told you before, that I defined to you before, then uh, a point, uh, uh, if you consider a vector bundle on P2 and a point, rank two vector bundle and one point, and we suppose that all the lines of, of the jumping lines of the bundle are the ones passing to the point and with order one, then we have two options. Then it doesn't characterize nearly free, but if it's the bundle uh, we started with, it's unstable or semi-stable, then E is indeed nearly free and I just recall here the resolution. And if E is stable, then it appears, um, it appears another family, which is specifically given by first term class minus one, normalized, of course, and second term class is equal to four, which is defined by the resolution that you see in the second sequence here, here in the slide, 
where uh, if we choose the point to be 0, 0, 1, then this matrix can be uh, uh, can be described by any cubic form not passing through the point and x square, y square. So the question that we ask ourselves is basically how do we get rid of this last of this last family? But this uh, taking a look, this can be given by invariance because look at these two forms, x square and y square. What happens if we take um, elements of the projective uh, linear group, so change of coordinates that maintain the point P fixed? Well, this does not give any problem because uh, when we are dealing with uh, linear forms, I just go a little bit to the previous slide, because if we have two linear forms which define the point P, the jumping point is defined by these two linear forms, by the way, always in the in the in a nearly free vector bundle. Uh, well, if we do a change of coordinates, we will have that fix the point, we will have other two linear forms, but there are other two linear forms which again fix the point, so they're a linear combination of the previous two. Uh, when I pass to um, quadratic forms, when I pass to forms of degree 2, this is broken because we cannot uh, fall again into the span inside the polynomials of degree 2 uh, given by s square and y square. So the trick is invariant. We have our group. And our group is, look, GP, the subgroup of the uh, projective linear group which fixes a point, okay? <coughs> and well, once we studied this, uh, this group, we were wondering also what happens to the groups that fixes any other uh, linear space, in this case of P2. So we uh, decided to consider also the group GL that fixes a line and the intersection of these two groups, which fix a flag of a point inside the line inside P2, and this group will be denoted by T, which is basically given by triangular matrices. And this, what, so this um, study of this action of these two groups is the content of the uh, this last work with Jean Vallès, uh, which just came on the archives a couple of months ago, one month ago. Okay. Well, first, the, I want to uh, show you that the behavior of a nearly free vector bundle under the action of the two group is, is nice because any element of any nearly free vector bundle with jumping point P, we think is 0, 0, 1, of course, is invariant under the action of uh, G, P, and T. And uh, the idea here, I put the dual diagram, but it's always the same, is because the invariance spreads all around the diagram and having, uh, this was the matrix M of the two linear forms X, Y. This is the um, change of coordinates, which fixes the point zero, zero, 001, gives these new linear forms, but these are given, they have a relation, a linear combination that relates one to the other, and we can express all of it inside the matrix N. And so the invariance is given. And if it works for GP, then T, well, it's the intersection of GP with GL, so this holds also for T, okay? Uh, on the contrary, the only invariant uh, nearly free um, vector bundle under the action of GL is the tangent bundle, a twist of the, of the tangent bundle of P2. Because, um, just look at this tangent bundle is the only stable nearly free vector bundle because that happens when a is equal to b equal to zero okay that's a very specific case and it's the only stable one but so nearly free bundles are invariant <coughs> what about the country can we characterize invariant uh, invariant bundle under the action that we consider and we focus on the group t because if we manage to do it for the group t then also it will imply the uh, characterization for the group GP, okay? So, the I was telling you in the beginning, the philosophy, the idea in trying to pass is that, okay, the important thing is first, let's see how the locus on the jumping lines. Let's just describe the locus on the jumping lines, okay? 
And beginning with this description, let's try to see if we get a resolution of these um, bundles which are invariant under the, uh, the action of the group T, okay? And once we have the resolution, let's see with the resolution what the invariance tells us to see, try, try to uh, narrow down our, uh, our family starting from the resolution. So the first thing we have to say, as I told you before, is that we have to see what is the geometric description of the locus of the jumping lines in the dual projective plane. So I consider I don't uniform, basically I'm taking away the tangent the tangent uh, bundle. I want to take away the tangent bundle, the uniform part, because it will be homogeneous. Rank two on P2, it will be homogeneous. Uh, so I take a non-uniform, the invariant, rank two vector bundle on P2. And we, uh, because of the invariance, we can see that we have two possible descriptions of uh, locus of jumping line set theoretically. Or it is a line, given by the dual of the point that we fix in a flag, or is the point given by the dual of the line that we fix in a flag. Moreover, the second case cannot occur, we just cannot have one jumping line if the first term class is equal to zero, or, uh, of course, of the normalized bundle, or F is unstable. And in this case, more precisely, we have three possibilities. So the T invariance tells us that all the lines that do not pass through the point have the same splitting type, and it's the generic splitting type, okay? I put here k and minus k plus c1 because I'm not supposing that f is stable, can be stable or unstable, so if f is stable, of course, this first item gives me uh, k equal to zero by grauer mullich theorem, okay? Uh, then all the line passing through the point have the same splitting type, except maybe from the other line that we, from the only line that we fix in a flag, which is the line L, which can have a different type of splitting type uh, with uh, a gap between the two integers bigger than what we have in the other two cases. Okay, once we have this description, we can prove the following key theorem. The following key theorem does not, uh, I'm not supposing that is invariant, I'm just supposing that I have a non-decomposable rank two vector bundle, which uh, was normalized as first rank class equal to zero, and set theoretically the, uh, the, the set of jumping lines, it's equal to the line defined by the dual of the point on P2, of a point on P2, uh, and I want to prove that is either a stable or semi-stable, so it cannot be stable. So I want to prove that this a bundle with this hypothesis cannot be stable. Uh, so let's suppose that it's stable and look at the incidence uh, correspondence, which is given by blowing up uh, P2 on the point P. Blow up P tilde and we have P2 and here the, uh, all the lines passing through P in the dual, um, in the dual uh, projective plane, okay? Um, because, I mean, the um, generic jumping line will have constant splitting, it, like the jump, it's something that works on open. So the generic jumping line will always have the same splitting and because of the stability of the bundle and the fact that we have that the jumping line is uh, the generic, point of this line P uh, dual will have, will give the same splitting, um, then we can construct using this, uh, using a Fourier Mukai basically, we can construct a section of uh, my bundle twisted by N minus H with N strictly bigger than H because F is stable and such that this uh, ideal of gamma uh, gamma is their zero dimensional scheme on P2, but the ideal of gamma is contains in the ideal, in the nth power of the ideal of my point P. Okay. And this tells us already that because our bundle is stable, first term class is zero, and in general, when this happens, the, uh, um, we have a curve of jumping lines of degree given by the second term class of uh, F. 
starting from this sequence, we have that the second chair class will be, so the degree of uh, the, the jumping locus in the dual projective plane, it's at least h times 2n minus h. Now, we would like to compute explicitly the multiplicity of one point inside this line into the projective uh, dual, in dual projective plane. And in order to do so, we want to recall a technique by Maruyama in 1983 that tells you how to determine the multiplicity of a singular point for rank two vector bundle on P2. What do you have to do? You take your vector bundle F, you take a jumping line, a generic jumping line. I'm supposing that this, uh, the generic jump is all minus H OL plus H because it's the case K to equal to zero. I mean, it's a stable case and first term class is equal to zero. So using the notation I introduced before, this is the generic splitting type. And look, well, if you have a splitting type of L, then you have a surjective map, which goes from F to OL minus H. Take the kernel. This is another vector bundle. And usually this short exact sequence that you see here in the middle of this diagram is called an elementary transformation. So do an elementary transformation and consider the same line L that you considered before. Restrict F1 to this L. And let's look at the splitting, okay? And <clears throat> let's do it again, one again, again, again. Just, and let's do another elementary transformation. So let's uh, consider the splitting of F1, consider the negative summon, do a surjective morphism, take the kernel, construct the bundle F2, and iterate this process, iterate these elementary transformations. Uh, well, in the step zero, the splitting on the line L, it's minus HH H, with H strictly positive. And so Maruyama, what tells you is look at the splitting in each one of your steps. And then all the splitting, we know the splittings on the i step by uh, the two integers, AI and BI. With AI, the, uh, the, it's bigger than BI. So look at all these splittings and look at the bigger one. Look at the sequence of the AIs that you find. Okay, once you get the first AI, which is non-positive, so less or equal than zero, you stop. And the multiplicity of the uh, of SF on this point that you've taken, it's actually is, uh, is given by the sum of all the sequence of integers AI that you found during the iterative elementary transformations. Okay? Perfect. So basically, what's, how, how do you find that uh, minus HH in this, in this horizontal middle uh, short exact sequence? So you take a jumping line and then you see in, uh, what is the intersection given by gamma by your line? In this case, counted with, it will be a zero dimensional scheme with length uh, n, because this zero dimensional scheme of length n associated to this OP2H minus n gives here a sum and OH. And then here we'll have, uh, having taken away like n points, this uh, splits us that structural shift of the zero-dimensional scheme and OL of minus H. And so the splitting is given considering this intersection of the line with gamma. Okay, but if this number of points determine the, um, the positive sum, the positive degree sum, then we want to see if we can choose a line between the generic jumping line such that uh, this um, this intersection with gamma one uh, drops the length of the zero dimensional scheme given by the intersection, drops by one. Can we do that? And actually we did that looking at the um, local descriptions of gamma around the point P that we are fixing, that, that, that we are considering. Because uh, gamma is, um, Gamma is given like the like a zero section of a vector bundle, and so locally it's a complete intersection. So locally it's given by uh, two non-homogeneous uh, non-homogeneous polynomials. 
And so, by the, uh, co having considered the generic, so we can vary the line, the jumping line that we are considering, consider the generic, we actually manage to construct, uh, to choose a line L in order to have uh, an ideal of uh, uh, an idea of gamma one, I said, sorry, another, um, another scheme gamma one, such that the intersection of the line with the gamma one is n minus one, a, a zero dimensional scheme with length n minus one. And this is, I mean, this is just checking out the polynomials and having the generic uh, line that passes through the points means that we can uh, think about some uh, uh, some generic generic properties of the two these two polynomials that uh, define gamma and gamma one locally. So the possibility to choose this line tells us that when we go to the k step, we drop at least at least by k the uh, positive sum and, and I say at least by k because we could have some. Um, monomials into the local description that it will tell that actual that will tell us that actually could have dropped more, but at least at the k step we drop the positive uh, um, summon by k. Perfect. So independently of what n and h are like, we have that in the n minus first step at most we have a non-positive direct summon. And using Maruyama theorem, we see that multiplicity of the point of uh, um, the scheme at the point is uh, uh, less or equal than Hn, and this implies combining with the other um, this inequality that I said before combines that H must be equal to n. But if H is equal to n, then the bundle is semi-stable. So stable is not possible. Okay. Perfect. With this very important, very key theorem in mind, we prove that any non-decomposable rank two vector bundle is T invariant if and only if is zero free. So let's suppose that T invariant. And the key idea is the same. Find the resolution and apply the action. If F is unstable or semi-stable, there is a unique negative section, so which K positive means this. Uh, well, K okay, non negative. And in this case, the invariance tells us because this is unique that the Z is also invariant by the action of G. This tells us that it's a complete intersection. But if Z is a complete intersection, we have a nice resolution of this ideal. And using the Horseshoe lemma, we have a resolution of F. And if we have a resolution of F, we apply the invariance. And applying the invariance, as I was trying to, um, to Best the idea before it means that we have these two linear forms, or else it, this is not invariant, and so this implies this h is equal to one, e one, and e two are equal to zero. So actually, f is nearly free. Yeah, I tried to the yeah, but this is the commutative term. This invariance it's an isomorphism that spreads on all the resolution. Uh, so if F is stable, then um, what we know that uh, uh, the invariance told us that um, that we have uh, a support uh, the set of the jumping uh, lines in the dual projective plane. It's uh, a line. So, but the theorem I told you before, this cannot give us that the first term class is equal to zero. So, the first term class is equal to minus one. And we consider another elementary transformation by that specific uh, jump that is given by the line L. The line L, capital L, is the line that was fixed in the flag, right? And so by this elementary transformation, we get this new vector bundle, G minus 1. And uh, the action of T fixes the line L. And it's also, we are supposing that F is invariant by the action of T. So this gives us a further commutative diagram. What's what's algebraic geometry without commutative diagrams, right? And um, 
So by this community diagram, we know that this isomorphism also implies an isomorphism on the left. So this is also G invariant, but this has first term class equal to zero. Therefore, this implies that necessarily G is semi-stable. G semi-stable means that G minus one as a section, as a, there is a map from O minus one to G minus one. So this means that F twisted by one as a global section. And of course, two, um, two things can happen. Uh, I have a unique global section in this case, sorry, I said zeta, but this is this, that's this gamma here. This is a complete intersection. We have a resolution. We apply the action. We need linear forms. We get a twist of the tangent bundle. And if uh, we have more than one global section, that means that actually G was two copies of OP2. That means that looking at this sequence up here, using the horseshoe lemma, so we have a resolution here, we have a resolution of OIL minus H minus I minus one on P2. So horseshoe lemma, we have a resolution of F, we apply the invariance, we apply the isomorphism that spread to all the diagram, and we see that actually that matrix can only be given by three linear forms, and three linear forms, once again, are the tangent bundle, but up to twist, okay? Okay, and I just want to conclude, last couple of slides, just, you know, uh, we spent first half of the talk uh, looking at the um, re relation between uniform and homogeneous vector bundle, and in the second part, basically we had almost uniform and almost homogeneous vector bundle. We could say, uh, define them in that way, call them that way, because uh, there is a very simple uh, description of the jumping lines. And we know that almost homogeneous, well, implies almost uniform. That's the fact that uh, invariant F, that configuration on the splitting type, but um, it was broken since the beginning, the reciprocal implication, because uniform, almost uniform, I mean, the geometric description of the jumping lines did not imply the invariance. We had that stable family that are, uh, that uh, that appeared, okay? And we wanted to generalize, to construct many, many families of stable bundles because there was also uh, a nice problem of many years ago to find flat families of stable vector bundles. So we wanted to, to go in that direction. But nevertheless, if we have so um, rank two vector bundle on P2, normalized, which has uh, all the jumping lines that pass through a point, but now we uh, suppose that the jump can be higher than the order of the jump. It's the same for all the lines, but of higher order, higher order. Then uh, if it's unstable or semi-stable, then this, it has this resolution. And in the case of R equal to one, this is given by um, this nearly free vector bundle the way before. This cohomological condition here that this intersection is empty inside of uh, this uh, cohomology group basically means that we cannot have any other jumping lines outside than the ones that pass through P. This is a general, this is a tra translation in terms of cohomology of this uh, geometric, um, of this hypothesis. And if they are stable, we have uh, we have the same cohomological condition that says we don't have any jumping lines other than the ones that uh, we want, the one that passed through P. But we find these this many, many families of stable vector bundle, which I do believe they deserve to be further, uh, further, further studied because it's always nice to find families of uh, stable vector bundles, okay? Um, now I thank you very much for your attention and your patience. And before, uh, well, I pass a little bit to see you again, but of course I will put the, <laughs> the presentations back on if, if needed. Thank you so much. Okay. With
I'm sorry, I don't say one thing not mathematical. I'm, I'm really so happy to see you all. Leterio appeared, Renato appeared, Darcy, Carolina, Eduardo, and Mauricio appeared. I mean, Israel and Nibaldo. I don't want to miss anybody, but I'm, I'm really so happy to see you all, even if in small squares. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Simone? I have a question, Simone. Uh, you can answer in the, with everyone. You don't have to put back your slide. But just, uh, just uh, when you when you you started by describing the problem of uh, let's say let's put it this way, um, classifying somehow the the uniform non-homogeneous uh, vector bundles on say P two, mm -hmm. and so. And, and I understood that you constructed many uh, new uniform bundles, and and but some of them were uniform, right? So I think that the the sorry, so, sorry. Them some uniform, of them right? yes, some of them were um, homogeneous, yes, and for, and some of them were not homogeneous, right? And yes. so how do you prove? Um, so what do you use to prove non homogene non homogeneity? Mm -hmm. of the bundle so how do you how do you prove this in general i mean in your cases but in my cases this is done by the nice explicit resolution that we have ah, from the resolution. The degrees of the resolution we only have one form of let's say low degree it was of degree two carolina yes, yes. and the other was of higher degree and yes. so it's it is invariant this form should remain invariant but that's impossible up to a change of coordinate yes yes and so, when, so when we have explicit description, then things pop out to the eye more directly, right? Uh -huh. Okay, nice. Okay. I was just wondering because I'm, I'm actually looking at, maybe we should talk at some point, I'm looking okay. at some, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, similar problems about uh, uniform and, and, and homogeneous vector bundles. But I've all oh, I've been trying to find a uh, a geometric you know if I could see geometric can you see geometrically that the bundles are not homogeneous without the the forms and the computations? Yes, there is actually Dreset this Dreset way of proving that they are uniform but not homogeneous using a geometrical description a projective geometrical description. Ah, that's very nice. Okay. So I will pass you yeah the 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 the. the reference the correct okay. reference okay okay great thank you yeah. and in any case i hope that at some point we can uh, we can discuss this it will and be even better if it is in person but that's and, uh, uh taking a, sorry advantage of your uh, question like somebody could have said well one type uniform bundles very easy just minus one zero zero they appear in any linear resolution that you take for any vector bundle on a shift, so they're not so uncommon. Uh, they're just uh, they're just secretly hidden inside the resolution that we take of the other bundles or shifts. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. You're you're welcome. Thank you for your question. More questions or comments for Simone? So I have a question myself. So. Uh, is there a moduli theory for invariant or homogeneous bundles? Uh, so you construct various types of families depending on the group uh, you take to, uh, to, 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 you know, to, uh, to, to act. But uh, it, it, is there some theory to tell you how big the, the families are and, uh, and if you can construct a moduli of these things? Uh, I didn't look at it, but the problem is that all my invariants are unstable. <laughs> so I cannot apply classical construction. I would have to go for something ad hoc, right? No, but yes, yeah. Um, so your, your bundles are not going to be, you know, some sub-scheme of the moduli space of stable bundles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. still, you can have families of these uh, unstable bundles, and they may lie, they may lie on some moduli. Um, Actually, I, I didn't see anything of the sort, and it's, yeah, interesting, but I didn't try. Actually, I was maybe a little bit lazy at the beginning, and I was starting to concentrate on that stable family that <laughs> that appeared in the last slide. So I was just trying, if I wanted to look at a model problem, 
I would start maybe to better define that stable family that arise in the last in the last. Uh, but of course, your question is super super interesting and it would worth it of future development. Okay, thank you. More questions for Simone. So let's uh, thank him again. Thank you.